One of the phrases most commonly associated with Nietzsche, in fact, the phrase most commonly associated with Nietzsche, is the phrase, will to power. It is, in fact, a piece of jargon. It's a philosopher's coinage. And it, on examination, means actually much less than it seems to. We've brought up the search for power, the craving for power, many times during the preceding lectures, but we haven't really focused much on the will to power. And, in fact, we do not in our writings about Nietzsche. This is somewhat at odds with some of the very recent work on Nietzsche, most notably the now famous German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who is very much in vogue, has a four-volume work in Nietzsche in which he talks about the will to power as the philosophy of Nietzsche, as Nietzsche's central metaphysical idea. In the analytic tradition, too, books are coming out as we speak, talking about the will to power as the core of Nietzsche's philosophical system. Our contention is, however, that it is not anything like that, that Nietzsche does talk about the will to power, but it doesn't deserve such a central place. Nevertheless, it's obviously an important concept, and we'd like to examine it in this lecture. One of the reasons, I think, that it's been taken to be such an important idea is that Nietzsche describes himself with some enthusiasm as having discovered the will to power. In a way, this is correct, but in another way, it doesn't acknowledge his predecessors. And I think Nietzsche has two different sets of precursors in his discovery, the most obvious being the philosopher Schopenhauer. We've already discussed Schopenhauer at some length, and spoken of how Schopenhauer believed that all of life, everything living, strives to keep itself going and beyond itself to keep its species going. Schopenhauer at times describes a fundamental impulse of the will as manifest in our world, the phenomenal world, as being a will to life, basically understood as a will to self-preservation and reproduction. In some passages where Nietzsche mentions will to power, he directly opposes will to power to the Schopenhauerian notion of will to life. One of his claims is that it's very obvious if you just look around in nature that there is something that creatures desire even more than life since they'll risk their lives. What they desire is power, vitality, or perhaps creative self-expression. They see themselves as only barely succeeding if they maintain themselves in existence. There's a desire to enhance themselves, even if that involves risking their lives. So on the one hand, this appears when he counters Schopenhauer to be something like a biological drive. Though we should keep in mind that for Schopenhauer too, the entirety of the phenomenal world, including inanimate matter or inanimate material objects, um, as well as biological entities, are all expressions of will. That's one of the reasons why will to power seems to be a kind of metaphysical vision on Nietzsche's part. Another basis for this kind of metaphysical reading, where will to power is the fundamental reality in general, comes from Nietzsche's notes, one that's particularly famous, uh, especially so after Oliver, Store, uh, sorry, after Oliver Stone gave Jim Morrison this line, reading Nietzsche, this world a monster of energy, Without beginning, without end, the world is the will to power and nothing besides. It's very dramatic, particularly in Oliver Stone's The Doors. However, it's not very clear what that means. I think this traces to Nietzsche's other set of influences, here the scientific worldview of his time. Although in general, much science preceding his era had involved models on the basis of mechanics, where inanimate matter intersected with inanimate matter in order to create certain kinds of collisions and um, have certain kinds of chemical results at times. Nietzsche was particularly enthusiastic about a kind of growing movement in physics that suggested that the basic stuff of the universe wasn't inert, but instead a, a matter of points of power. A little unclear, I think, in terms of trying to spell out what exactly these would be like. But I think this translates in our way of looking at things as something like dynamic energy. The vision that matter and energy might at times be the same thing or might be converted to one another, a much more common idea in 20th century science, 
I think, travels along the same direction that Nietzsche wanted to go. He was quite elated with the idea that one might view a kind of basic scientific system as dealing with dynamism rather than basic stuff that somehow has to be motivated and moved. To view movement as primary rather than stasis was something that he saw as very much in keeping with his own way of looking at things. And so passages like this, which is in, in one of Nietzsche's notebooks, not in something he published, lend support to the idea that Nietzsche was basically trying to come up with a kind of fundamental cosmology or vision of the basic stuff of the universe. And I think to a certain extent that's true. In his published writings, however, he doesn't talk about will to power so much in this light. In fact, in his published writings, he very rarely makes any assertions about will to power at all. He very famously makes it clear in one of the most famous passages where he mentions will to power that this is a kind of thought experiment, or as my theory has it. In other words, he doesn't present this as absolutely true, but instead something that he's speculated about, something he thinks worth considering, and indeed something worth trying on as a thought experiment in general. If one does take this view of reality, not surprisingly, psychological reality is going to follow suit. And as we've already discussed, Nietzsche does see the desire for power, sometimes in a very straightforward way, to be a fundamental human psychological motivation. Nevertheless, it's important to make clear that Nietzsche does not think that the power that human beings want is necessarily the kind of obnoxious, assertive, domineering kind that he associates with the ancient practitioners of master morality. For example, in a passage in Gay Science, he makes very clear that benefiting and hurting others are ways of exercising one's power upon others. That is all one desires in such cases. While one can usually see that hurting others does exhibit one's power, it may seem less obvious why benefiting others is a kind of expression of power. And I think the fact that Nietzsche often sees opposite kinds of human expression to be motivated by the same thing, something that's pretty fundamental to his psychology, um, what this shows is that his sense of power is really quite open and, in a sense, unspecified. It only gets specification in particular cases, in particular human situations. And it might be something viewed as much as a, it, it might most often be viewed as a virtue, not necessarily primarily as a vice. Certainly the primary way in which history has moved, in his opinion, has always been motivated by someone or some group's desire to express their power, but not necessarily politically or militarily. Indeed, there are many ways of expressing power. It changes from time to time, and as Kathy says, it's certainly not always military or by straightforward aggression. In one of his earliest books, uh, the book Daybreak, Nietzsche writes, the means of the craving for power have changed, but the same volcano is still glowing. What one formerly did for God's sake, one now does for the sake of money, which now gives the highest feeling of power. It's important to notice that power is not one thing. Power takes many different forms, many different manifestations, and the energy, the metaphor that Kathy just suggested, um, gives us a clue that energy takes many different forms, has many different manifestations, and while physicists might talk about energy, the truth is that almost everything interesting that they say is about some particular kind of energy or some particular manifestation of energy. So too, with power, we should distinguish well. Nietzsche is very clear that we all do what we want to do, and what we want to do is to increase our power. But of course, some people, the masters of master morality, are in a position to do this very easily. And also, they're in a position to do it very subtly. They can impose upon themselves all sorts of interesting restrictions and challenges, such that, for example, you create an artwork out of minimal materials or given a certain very strict set of rules, as we discussed earlier. And this is not an external imposition, but an internal imposition, and it's another way of proving one's power. At the same time, people who are not in a position of doing what they want people who are not in a position of straightforwardly exercising their power are capable of doing almost anything. He says in the same book, one should distinguish well. Whoever still wants to gain the consciousness of power will use any means, 
He, however, who has it becomes very choosy and noble in his tastes. There's a sense in which the very phrase, the will to power, is, I think, systematically misleading. And I often say to my students, for example, that really what Nietzsche means is neither will nor power. And I sometimes add, nor does he mean the, nor does he mean to. Let me explain that. The notion of the will, as Kathy mentioned, comes more or less directly from Schopenhauer, and he takes it more or less directly from Kant. Now, there's a huge difference between the two. For Kant, the will is something individual. Each of us has a will, and will is basically what it lies behind our actions. We choose our actions, we will our actions. For Schopenhauer, the will is emphatically not individual. It is one will, which is in some sense inside of or behind all of us, And the individual will is, as we mentioned earlier, something of a problem. The whole question of agency is open to question. Nevertheless, Nietzsche rejects both notions. He maintains with Kant the idea that what we're talking about is the individual. But to talk about the will, that, he says, is a fiction. The idea that there is some agent, that there is some special, I don't know what to call it, a force? behind our actions, which is somehow cut off from, insulated from, the causes and effects of the natural world, including the workings of our brain. That can only be a philosopher's fantasy. It has nothing to do with how we actually work. So to talk about will in the Kantian sense is nonsense, except for the fact that Kant is right in, in some sense, focusing in on the individual. With Schopenhauer, the problem is the opposite. Because it's one will, this metaphysical entity, Nietzsche, who throughout his philosophy, quite contrary to Heidegger and some current theorists, really pushes away and rejects metaphysics. This idea of a metaphysical will is something that he wants to reject, even if, as in Schopenhauer, it is something which we personally experience in our own case. So what he's talking about should not be conceived of as a will. One might talk about the motive to power or something like that. But by power, of course, we also open up a whole door of possible misunderstandings. Most importantly, there's the idea that power means military or political power. Now, the Germans actually distinguish this by talking about Reich for political power, and the word that Nietzsche uses is Macht. But to think of Macht, I think, as power lends itself to a misunderstanding. Perhaps a better translation would be something like strength, although there's another word for that, or even self-expression, although that can't be a literal translation. So I think what Nietzsche is referring to by the will to power might better be thought of as the will to be oneself, the will to show oneself for what one is, the will to feel alive and feel vital and creative. Now what about the and to? Well, the very simply indicates that there is some singular thing. If we're talking about Schopenhauer, Talking about the will makes perfectly good sense. But we're not talking about Schopenhauer. And for Nietzsche, it's the many manifestations and the many differences that are of importance. And two, well, two very simply indicates a kind of goal orientation, something Kathy will talk about in a second. But the idea that what we want is to achieve a certain goal, to increase power, to get power, and so on, I think is very misleading for Nietzsche. Because what he's talking about is something different. Indeed, I think that there is a kind of tendency to think of will to power as wanting some desirable state. As Nietzsche understands will to power, in fact, one of the things he thinks is desirable about the expression, it's always on the way toward. So there is no sense in which one completes the project of being will to power. You can't get enough power, at least in the sense that Nietzsche means it. Certainly many of the kinds of goals that people set for themselves are quintessential and very clear manifestations of will to power. Someone who does run for high office is seeking power in a straightforward way. Someone who seeks wealth, another way, but also someone who seeks knowledge or truth. Nietzsche is very clear about the fact that will to truth is a manifestation of will to power. He comments, or has Zarathustra comment, will to truth you call it? A will to the thinkability of all being, this I call your will. 
all being you want to make thinkable, for you doubt with well-founded suspicion whether it is thinkable. Yet it shall yield and bend for you. That is your entire will, a will to power. Also when you speak of good and evil and valuations. So many of the more spiritual kinds of projects that have been very fundamental to not only Western society, but to human civilization in general, Nietzsche would also view as matters of will to power. In fact, they're very subtle, but very broadly based. He claims that one wants reality to bend to one, to make reality form itself in accordance with one's own mind. That has to be viewed as a very, very basic sense of the drive for power. What Nietzsche, I think, has in mind that ends up spilling over into an idea we'll talk about in the next lecture, eternal recurrence, is also that it's essential that will to power be understood as something driving the present. It's, in a sense, an engine that motivates the person in the present tense. Even if one achieves high office, wealth, um, a certain modicum of truth, that doesn't satisfy will to power. It's where you are in the present. It's like one of those goals that you've put behind you, perhaps set a trophy on your shelf, but one moves on. And so will to power is never extinguished um, in that life itself is never extinguished in Nietzsche's um, terminology. The individual might die eventually, but until that last moment of consciousness throughout, there's always a sense of trying to gain further power. So no particular individual goal will satisfy it, and there's no particular individual manifestation of it that is more will to power than any other. What Nietzsche does see, and, and what he does to Schopenhauer's notion of will, is to give the will, in a sense, more specification in individual cases. So actually, any human motivation, he will end up seeing as a kind of motivation toward power. Um, and sometimes his analyses that show us this, including this analysis I just read about will to truth, um, some of these are very subtle and don't seem perhaps from the outside to be manifestations of will to power at all. But Nietzsche does think that in each particular psyche, however the balance may turn out, there's always this drive to enhance one's vitality, to fully express oneself. And it's only when one is feeling relatively sick or relatively tired that one tends to recede, and even then it's only to regain one's strength for further expression. So, in a sense, the way the will to power functions is not something Nietzsche is going to predict in advance. It isn't something that he limits to metaphysical accounts um, or cosmological accounts or accounts of the basic stuff of the world. Indeed, he would say every single goal of any, anything in the universe, perhaps, but certainly human beings and probably most mammals, any particular goal is a manifestation of will to power. And the particular goal is something that will to power finds before itself at a given point. And when that goal is met, another one takes its place. In this sense, Nietzsche has very much picked up the whole shape of Schopenhauer's analysis, but given it a different and he thinks much more positive spin. One of the more popular seminars in current day American life for business people, but for people in general, is something that's typically called goal setting or achieving your goals. It's often coupled with another seminar, equally popular, called time management. I think from a Nietzschean perspective, it's worthwhile to reflect on what these are all about. Setting goals, what is that? Well, you sort of say, here's what I'd like to be in a certain amount of time, and here's how I'd like to get there, and here's the most efficient way of doing that. A lot of our students, who are pressured by their parents, by their advisors, by their peers, and of course by television and so on, to say what they're going to do with the rest of their lives, which is very different from the childhood question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because it's got a sense of urgency and it has a sense of practicability that children don't have to cope with. And what they do is they sort of say, here's what I should be. And they set a goal. I'd like to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. Or I would like to be a vice president of a big corporation by the time I'm 35. Something like that. But what gets left out? Well, what gets left out is any conception of interest or any conception that this is the right thing for you to do. Even, in some sense, any conception of one's own talents and abilities. 
There was a very good book that came out. Well, no, there was a very good title that came out several years ago. I apologize to the author because um, I don't remember who it is. But the title was just so wonderful, and I use it to all my students. The title was, Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow. And it makes a very important point. Joseph Campbell made the same point in his mythology series when he talked about following your bliss. Basically, the idea is that life consists of doing what you love. And what you love is not something you are told to do from the outside. What you love, if it's true love, is something you discover in yourself through experimentation, through trial and error. And doing what you do because you love it is not a guarantee, but it's probably the best possible advice on how to succeed in doing what you do. Now the problem with goal setting and the problem with thinking about the will to power as a kind of goal is that if you set it as a goal, whether it's power itself or any particular manifestation of power, you make it all the less likely you're going to get there. One of my friends pointed out that in corporate life, it's the corporations that say, we've got to meet this financial projection, this bottom line. Those are the ones that in the long run are more likely to fail because it's the companies that pay attention to what they do and do well, pay attention to their customers, pay attention to their product. They're the ones that succeed. Aristotle argued many years ago that if a person says, I want to be happy, well, there's something self-defeating about that. Of course you want to be happy, but how do you do it? By being the most excellent person you can be given your own virtues. Now, what Nietzsche is saying about will to power, I think, can be put in the following way. Life is a process. Life is ongoing. And life is, consists of the passions with which we throw ourselves into what we're doing. When Kathy referred to the energy concept that Nietzsche borrowed from physics, I think that has a very personal manifestation too. The idea of one's life as energetic. Contrast this with a very traditional philosophical notion. One finds it both in the East and in the West. But it has to do with the ultimate end of philosophy and the ultimate end of life and the point of many religions, which might be characterized as a kind of tranquility or peace of mind, or in some cases even a kind of apatheia, a kind of apathy, a kind of freedom from the perturbance of emotions. Well, one can see that Nietzsche would find all such views very much like the last man he describes in Zarathustra, somebody who's kind of dead to the world, who might in some banal sense be happy, but really has nothing to offer either him or herself or anyone else. The image that Nietzsche wants to project is that life is exciting. Life is taking risks. Life is essentially dangerous. And when we think about life, we should think in terms of how to maximize this energy, this vitality, and that's what life is all about. Now here again, he comes into the orbit of Darwin and very much in conflict with Darwin. We talked earlier about how Nietzsche disagrees with the notion of natural selection and survival of the fittest because in fact, it's probably not the best that will survive and very often it's going to be the most banal or the most ordinary. But here, there's a very different kind of spin we can put on the same argument that what Darwin talks about is the survival of the fittest. And as Kathy said a minute ago, it's not survival that counts, but if you look at nature, but in particular if you look at most human beings, what they do isn't about survival. In fact, when someone tells us that their main goal in life is to live to be 100, we right away think, there's something wrong with this person. That's not the kind of goal that people should have. What you want is to be a great this or a great that. And if long life comes with it, so much the better. But the idea of thinking of life not as survival, but rather as self-expression, as the exercise of excellence, that's a very different matter. In one of his most brutal comments, he quite clearly goes up against Darwin. This comes from the book Beyond Good and Evil. He says, here we must be aware of superficiality and get to the bottom of the matter, resisting all sentimental weakness. Life itself is essentially appropriation, injury, overpowering of what is alien and weaker, suppression, hardness, imposition of one's own forms, incorporation, 
and at least at its mildest, exploitation. But why should one always use those words in which a slanderous intent has been imprinted for ages? That's a particular, particularly brutal quote, but I think the idea is clear enough. Life is cruel, and that's the way it is. If you watch any of the many nature documentaries, for example, on television, what becomes evident as you watch the coyotes slaughtering the rabbit or the uh, hyenas attacking the baby warthog, what you see is nature red in tooth and claw. And that's the way it is, and that's the way we are. Not that we can't sublimate and civilize ourselves, but if we're talking about basic motivations, if we're talking about what is deep inside of us and what drives us, then we can't ignore the fact that we are part of that animal kingdom. And in fact, as human beings with our extra intelligence, with what philosophers delight in calling reason, it only becomes more complicated and in a way more cruel or more subtle and cruel. Because the truth is that the will to power, as Nietzsche puts it, isn't just a matter of trying to keep afloat, trying to survive, but it really is a, try, a sense of trying to excel. And in a competitive world, which is certainly what this is, that means at the same time trying to make the best of what one is, even at the expense of other people. Now this deep psychological notion, this idea of the will to power, or more accurately, the will to making oneself everything that one can be, is what Nietzsche uses as a counter, as we pointed out in an earlier lecture. For example, to Mill's utilitarianism and its rather banal and agreeable sense that what we really strive for is pleasure and the avoidance of pain. In a way, this kind of formulation simply ignores our relationship to other people. More important, it ignores our relationship to ourselves. One can be full of pleasure and be completely vacuous. One thinks of someone, for example, on drugs. One can be in pain or a great deal of suffering, but at the same time being living life to its fullest. And of course, Nietzsche's always example is the artist who very often subjects him or herself to a lifetime of struggle and dissatisfaction. And here what, ne what Kathy had to say makes perfectly good sense when you think about the life of creativity in any form, that there is no point of satisfaction. And this isn't a matter of greed, and it's not a matter of Schopenhauerian pessimism, but the very nature of being creative is you can't long be satisfied with what you've done before you move on to your next project. Nietzsche, for example, finished one book, The Twilight of the Idols, one morning, and that afternoon started the book, The Antichrist. And many of the writers I know, it's the same project. What they do is they finish one, and they can't wait to start the other. As Goethe put it, from desire, I rush to satisfaction. From satisfaction, I leap to desire. The truth is that we are desiring creatures. To think of life in terms of complacency or contentment, to think of life in terms of tranquility or peace of mind, is really to, die, to deny the kinds of creatures we are. So, going back to master morality, and the sorts of things that Nietzsche actually advocates. It's not just a matter of being in control, but rather it's a matter of self-expression. The word aristocracy, as we mentioned, doesn't just mean rule by the elite. It means, quite literally, rule by the best. And the important thing is to make yourself the best. If we consider the features of will to power that we've been discussing, Nietzsche's conception of the Übermensch makes a lot more sense, I think. We pointed out that Übermensch isn't to be viewed as an evolutionary goal in a straightforward sense. Nevertheless, Nietzsche does talk about the Übermensch as something to seek for humanity in the future to be able to live up to. It's an ideal, and an ideal of continual creativity and self-expression that we can look to in our own lives, even if we can't entirely exemplify. I think he doesn't really expect for later generations to be able to be continually creative, too. Presumably, they'll also need sleep. But the Übermensch is intended to be something like a further descendant of ours. In fact, you might say that what Nietzsche is trying to do is move the direction of evolution away from the notion of the descent of man to something like the ascent of man. What kind of future child or descendant of our children could we hope to bring about by the way we live now?
And that's a kind of expression of will to power that reaches even into further generations. Thanks.